tests are marked, obviously. Uh, I was really pleased with how they went on average, actually. Uh, a lot of really high marks. Uh, I don't know the average off the top of my head, but it was high. Um, so that was excellent. I'm really, really happy to see that. Shows me that stuff is going into your heads. That's really, <laughs> that's really the point of all this. So um, yeah, that was really pleasing to see. My only worry about the very high average is that it will misrepresent how the rest of the course is going to go. So if you got a, a few of you got 100% on this test, and you can't, I don't want to create the expectation that you're just going to maintain 100% through the rest of the course. Uh, that would be extremely hard to do. The, I expect the average, usually the average on the essays is lower than the average on the tests because the tests are like, did you acquire the concepts that I'm presenting? And the essay has part of that, but it also has do some of your own kind of critical thinking and reasoning stuff, which is a substantially harder task. So just with that little caveat in mind, um, probably we won't have the same average on the future elements as on the test, but very, very happy to see how it went. Uh, so well done, everyone. Well, well done on average. You as a group did very, very well. <laughs> uh, yeah. OK. Um, I promise you that this week we would talk about the essays. Uh, I didn't really uh, set that up yet, but we'll talk about it on Wednesday if that's okay. Uh, so on Wednesday, I'll have a kind of outline for you of what the essay format should look like, uh, what you should expect. I mean, in general, I think uh, most essays that I write are about 50% exposition, 50% your thoughts. So that's about the ratio I'm looking for. Could be a little less or a little more on one or the other side, but that's about it. Yeah, you had a question. For that first prompt, should we also read the proper like section that it references or just the Grinnell chapter? I mean, it would be a good idea to also read the popper. Yeah, it would also be a good idea to read the popper. Can you get access to that for free? Uh, you, let me look into that. Okay. Uh, let me look into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, in, in general, I recommend Googling any of the topics that you're writing on. Like, there's tons of secondary material. You actually have access to tons of primary material. Skim it. Usually, there's like, I mean, when I'm doing research on something like this, start with Wikipedia. Start there. Uh, don't cite it in your papers, but like, that's a really good place to get oriented in the basic ideas. Uh, so, if you've done the reading, do the Wikipedia. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is almost always a good resource to draw on if you want a like, slightly more advanced presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh boy, that is, a, that is a very challenging question to answer. What counts as common knowledge? It's going to be a, I don't have a rule for you. I don't have a good crisp rule. Uh, it changes from field to field. From field to field, it changes from year to year. It changes from a uh, group of people to a group of people. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's not a context-free answer to that question. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I don't know. Ask a friend who's not taking this course, and if they know it, then that's a, there's a good chance it's common knowledge. That's the be I, I'm sorry, that's the best suggestion I have. There's really not a good crisp answer to that. Anyway, okay, so we'll talk in depth about uh, structure and formatting of the essays on Wednesday. Uh, any questions about that or about the test? Okay, so let's just dive in then. So we've been talking, we did this sort of shift in our topic. We went from Grinnell, who was very much describing how science works as a matter of fact. Last time we started talking about uh, Karl Popper and his demarcation criterion, that is his his rule for deciding whether something counts as science or doesn't count as science. And this is certainly supposed to be sort of a picking out the good stuff. Popper is a big fan of science. He doesn't think it is just, you know, trying to distinguish one, two equally good categories. He wants to find the good stuff, and the good stuff is the science. And his criterion was falsification. Uh, that is, uh, something is a scientific theory if it could be falsified by experiment or observation. Um, so the, the potential for something to be falsified is what makes something scientific for, for Popper. Uh, he had, the, and we discussed briefly, this 
very weird thing that he says. So uh, his attitude about induction, I think, surprises a lot of people who have heard of the falsification as a criterion. It's, yeah, yeah, falsification, that's the thing. Uh, but Popper's attitude towards induction is maybe a little weird and uh, surprising if you haven't read this guy before. So just to say induction, using a bunch of specific observations to generate a general rule. So I've observed a thousand swans and all of them are white, therefore all swans are white. So this is going from some finite set of specific observations to a general rule that a class or category, uh, you know, all swans are white is a pretty, still a pretty specific rule. You might say something like, I've observed a thousand objects falling and therefore I've deduced what the gravity, or I've induced, sorry, what the gravitational constant is or the, the rate at which things fall. You know, this is the inductive process and I think most of us probably naturally assume that this has got a lot to do with how science works, right? You do induct, what you do when you're doing science is make a bunch of observations and then make a graph and then generalize them. Uh, and that's how you get to the hypothesis, or that's how you get to the scientific theory. But Popper actually, for a couple of slightly wonkish philosophical reasons, uh, thinks that induction really has nothing to do with scientific, the justification of scientific theories. So I read out this, a theory of induction is superfluous, has no function in a logic of science. Um, that's not to say that he doesn't think that it has a function in science. So I'd like to sort of distinguish. So the weird counterintuitive nature of this proposal uh, is maybe hopefully clarified a little bit when we get very clear on what Popper, what exactly Popper is trying to do. Um, so he does think that induction doesn't justify scientific theories. Uh, he thinks that we use observation in the following way. We have a, a hypothesis, who cares where it came from, and then you, you show that it's a worthwhile hypothesis by testing it against observations. And the, the more tests it survives, the more, in some sense, worthwhile it is. Um, but that's not to say, so he says, it can never be justified, verified, or even shown to be probable. Uh, because he, think in, he thinks there's this deep problem with induction. We talked last time about the problem of induction. Uh, we talked about the problem of going from some set of observations to a general rule. I mean, the, the white swans thing is a, is a prime example where it's just not the case that all swans are white. There's tons of black swans in the world. So no matter how many white swans you observe, in some sense, in principle, you can never be certain that all swans are white. And then the problem of induction makes it seem like not only can you not be certain, you actually get no information at all without using circular reasoning. So these are the kind of worries that Popper has about induction. They're kind of classic philosophical worries. Uh, and he thinks that in, and this is the key term, a logic of science, you don't need induction. So, uh, yeah, so we don't ever prove that our theories are true or even justified. Uh, all we have are theories that have stood the test. And standing the test doesn't make a theory, doesn't mean you should believe that the theory is true for Popper. It doesn't mean that you should, you should uh, you know, be convinced that it's right. Standing the test just means that it's a good theory in some broad sense of good. It's been corroborated, we might say. Uh, to use Van Frossen's term, you might say we accept the theory rather than believe it. Yeah, you think, OK, this is a pretty good one for now. And you know, there is some, as, as initially counterintuitive as that might feel, there's some justification for this attitude, like uh, many of the really powerful, fruitful scientific theories that we've had turned out to be not true. Uh, Newtonian, we'll talk a little bit today about Newtonian mechanics. Newtonian mechanics was enormously productive. It made incredible predictions for hundreds of years. And it turns out not to be quite right. Uh, not even, not just in its detail, but in the very structure of the theory turns out to not re accurately represent reality. And you can say the same thing about quantum mechanics and general relativity. Uh, these are spectacularly successful theories in terms of surviving attempts to falsify them. In terms of surviving comparisons with observation, quantum mechanics, general relativity, they're just unbelievably good theories, incomparably good. Um, but we know that they can't both be true, uh, 
and they've both survived confrontations with observation. So we know that they're, con they're contradictory in their assumptions. So should you believe that quantum mechanics and relativity are the truth about reality? Maybe if you pick one, choose it to be the truth. I don't know what basis you'd have for picking one over the other at this point in history. So even our most successful theories often turn out to be either not quite right or deeply wrong, um, but they nonetheless made really good predictions. So maybe the safest attitude to have towards our best scientific theories is they're incredibly valuable and powerful knowledge. Uh, they stood up to this rigorous testing of trying to check them against experience, but that, that doesn't tell you that they're likely to be true. Something like that. Okay, but I think even, even more deeply to sort of resolve the sort of counterintuitive proposal that induction doesn't have much to do with science, uh, we should keep, go back to these questions that we started off with the very beginning of the course. So these two separate questions, and notice that Popper's really much more interested in one than the other. And this is the kind of shift that we've done in the course uh, right after the test. Grinnell was very deeply concerned with how does science work. Grinnell wanted an, wanted an accurate description of the actual practice of science. Right? So he's, he's, really, he's really trying to get us to see how the process in a, as a matter of fact works. And Popper really doesn't care that much about that. Uh, his, I mean, he's, it's not that he's utterly indifferent, but his main project is the justification. So how does, how should science work? In the sense of uh, how, do we, how do we justify our theories? How do we, once you've got a theory, how do you test it against our best sort of like epistemic sort of knowledge producing uh, criteria. So in some sense he's leaving, he's leaving aside this how does science work and really focusing in on how should science work. Uh, so okay, so there's, there's Popper. Uh, today we're going to start talking about, uh, we've been, I've been sprinkling in a little bit of Kuhn as we go along. Today we're going to focus in on uh, Thomas Kuhn and his idea of the, uh, ideas as presented in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And Kuhn's proposal is essentially that you don't, it doesn't make sense to pick just one of these questions. Uh, that if you're going to answer how should science work, you're not allowed to, or it doesn't make sense to ignore how it does in fact work. Uh, that what we need is answers about how science could be justified. So the logic or the philosophy of science has to be informed by facts about how it actually works in reality. Um, if you want this put in a pithy ethical principle, uh, uh, Kant has this rule, ought implies can. So if you say somebody should be doing acting in a certain way, that logically implies that it's possible for them to act that way. Right? So if I say you should flap your arms and fly away, you could say, you could very justifiably say, no, I shouldn't, I, that's not the case that I should do that, because I can't do that. That's beyond the possibilities of my, of my biology. So if we're saying that science should work some way, that seems to imply, logically apply by, by Kant's odd implies can, that it could work that way. So facts about how science can work or how it does work do seem to have some logical relationship with this question of how it should work. There's an argument that these are not, these are not questions that you can cleanly separate. Uh, this is an argument, by the way, for the kind of philosophy of science that uh, I did in my PhD, which is combined history and philosophy of science. So there's been a few different streams of approaching you know, the overall study of science. Popper's from this really pure analytic philosophy tradition where Really, really what they're doing is conceptual analysis as separate from looking at the facts of history. Uh, and in around the 1970s, when Kuhn publishes Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, the discipline takes what you might call the historical turn. People start paying much more attention to practice and how it's actually done. Okay. Um, so this is the, but this is the sort of classic attitude, the pre-Kuhnian attitude expressed by Hans Reichenbach. Uh, 
uh, and this is basically uh, Popper's view too, says the philosopher of science is not much interested in the thought process which lead to scientific discoveries. He looks for a logical analysis of the completed theory, including the establishing its validity. That is, he's not interested in the context of discovery, but in the context of justification. So on this view, and this is the view that uh, Reichenbach had, this is the view that Popper had, and it was a very prevalent view mid 20th century in uh, philosophy of science, there's just two profoundly different questions. Given a scientific theory, how do we say whether it's good or not? Versus how did we get that scientific theory? And Grinnell, of course, was deeply interested in the, the, mo the process of discovery and how that discovery gets turned into a credible scientific uh, claim. Uh, the belief at this time was, nah, you don't really have to worry about that stuff. That that's not, that's not kind of the job of philosophy. Um, no. So Kuhn makes the case uh, that, so this is this structure of scientific revolutions, that that's not okay. Basically, you have to pay attention to how science actually works if you're going to talk about its logic. So even, the so even if you're really interested in the project of justifying completed scientific theories, you can't just ignore how they're actually produced. And Kuhn's argument brings with it a different picture of what gets to count as science. So today we'll do a little bit of comparison between Kuhn and Popper in terms of how they would demarcate science from non-science. Okay, so recall this, uh, this was a nice example of Popper's sort of way of demarcating science from non-science. It's a very famous experiment where uh, you know, there's a bunch of kind of Newtonian pictures of how light and gravity behave, uh, you know, post-Newtonian, people working after Newton, but, uh, and then there was this kind of crucial test. Um, Einstein's theory was the only one that predicted that light would bend when it co goes close to a large gravitational mass, and uh, he makes this very risky prediction about which stars you'll see if you point out a telescope right next to the sun during an eclipse, uh, and it turns out he's right. So this is one of the moments that marks a huge conceptual shift from Newton to Einstein, uh, a huge kind of change in the way the, base, the basic structure of the theory. Einstein introduces profoundly new assumptions and uh, methods and all this stuff. But the fact is that these kind of major turning points are like a tiny, tiny fraction of how science is actually practiced. Like almost all science doesn't have this dramatic, like this is a very dramatic, like your whole framework versus my whole framework. Now Popper's picture works pretty well for these very dramatic turning points. Um, but it's not so clear that that even describes almost all of the science that happens. Almost all of the science is actually performed happens within one of these frameworks. So this is a shift from one framework, framework to another. Almost all science happens within a framework. And people aren't going out trying to falsify their theories, they are, or their assumptions, or their, their kind of framework overall. They're working within it, and they're trying to use it to produce new results, new positive results. Um, so it's just not clear how to connect Popper's picture of the justification of theories with almost everything that almost all scientists do with their lives, right? Like, there's one Einstein to every thousand or 10,000 people who just work within a framework. So Kuhn is gonna try to bring in and kind of at least describe this like 99.9% .9 of science that's not revolutionary in the way that uh, this big turn makes it seem like. So uh, roughly here's his picture. Uh, we'll call it the Kuhn cycle. Kuhn didn't call it that. That would be extremely vain to call it that, but uh, we'll, we'll call it that. Uh, and I think we'll get through about half of this cycle today. So the pre-science, so before you've got a paradigm, you're just kind of messing around, a whole bunch of people not on the same page. And eventually you get into a paradigm. You're doing what he calls normal science. Uh, and then normal science chugs along for a little while. 
start getting some anomalies. You might call that model drift. So the models stop agreeing perfectly with observation. Eventually those uh, anomalies build up to the point where people kind of lose confidence in the framework that they're in. They're deeply worried about it. They're no longer comfortable making the assumptions of the paradigm. Uh, and then there's this model revolution where people start rethinking the assumptions, start using new assumptions, which you might call a paradigm change or a paradigm shift. And then that paradigm shift leads to a new, new era of normal science. So I uh, should emphasize that these paradigms can be uh, nested. So you can have, you know, you've got biology. In biology, there's the evolutionary structure. But there can be little paradigms within that. So there's like the population genetics paradigm. Within the population genetics paradigm, you might have even smaller paradigms. So this can happen at many scales in science. It's not just sort of the biggest scales. But he thinks that this, this kind of pattern goes over and over again throughout history. And he tries to identify this happening in history. Right? So a bunch of examples of science is going through this cycle of normal science, anomalies building up, paradigm shift back to normal science. OK. So today I propose to just go through a couple of these phases and maybe compare it a little bit to Popper's picture and talk a little bit about how a different way of thinking about what science is emerges when you look at it through this lens. Yeah? OK. So start from the pre-science moment. Um, so this is one of Kuhn, I gave you a couple of examples before. Here's one of Kuhn's examples from the structure of scientific revolutions. So the early days of studying electricity, 1800s sort of thing, 17, 1800s. Uh, there was a bunch of different schools of thought, right? So the, the study of electricity hadn't coalesced around one perspective, one way of thinking. Uh, one, for example, studied the static, the property of the static electricity. So if you Sorry. If you, this is a piece of amber, and if you rub it with fur or wool or something like that, if you rub a piece of amber, it'll build up static electricity. So this is something you, know, you can experiment on. You can play with this property. Uh, and there's one school that thinks that the attractive force of static electricity is the most important thing, uh, and another that regarded attraction and repulsion as equally important. And so, when you rub a piece of amber with wool, say you've got little bits of chaff, like the, the husks that are around wheat, they're very light and they're easily attracted. The chaff will be attracted to the amber and then bounce off. Um, and this first group that thought the attractive pro properties of static electricity was the thing, considered the bouncing off to be a kind of secondary effect. They wanted to understand the being attracted to it. Right? That was their primary object of study. They were kind of curious about the bouncing off, but they figured it was probably just like bouncing. Like it's just a mechanical, you know, you, you flick something against a hard surface, it'll bounce off. So for them, the bouncing off was eh, not that important as a phenomenon. So this first group studying the attractive force is intensely interested in one half of this phenomenon. Uh, attraction and repulsion, consider them kind of equally -ish important. And there's a whole other group studying conduction. So like w by the 1800s, you're, you, started, you start to have like chemical batteries. So not static electricity, but like moving electricity. What's the opposite of static electricity? Dynamic electricity. Dynamic electricity. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So you've got uh, this other group studying, let's call it dynamic electricity. And they're just, they're just not on the same page as either of these two groups. Um, so you've got three different, at least three different kind of broad collections of people studying electricity, and they're not using the same language. Uh, they don't think that the same phenomena are important, uh, and their research programs are just kind of going in all different directions. So this is the pre-scientific phase where, uh, you know, it's just not everybody's pulling in the same, in the same direction, uh, and not much. I mean, some progress is made. You can come up with interesting experiments that produce interesting kind of phenomena that you can study. Um, but it's when, I think it's Benjamin Franklin, roughly, who makes the connection between conductive electricity and static electricity. And when you get that, you get that the positive and negative sort of like 
polarities of electricity can also explain why the shaft bounces off because once it touches the amber now it's got the opposite charge of the amp so it's, it's got sorry it's got the opposite charge when they're separate once it touches they've got the same charge and same charges repel so putting together electricity both static and dynamic uh, and eventually putting that together with magnets so like seeing how these are all aspects of the same phenomena is the emergence of the paradigm. So we all start using the same language, we all start using the same kind of models and on, like assumptions about what, what's in the world. Uh, and at that point, the sort of the productivity of this research program explodes. Uh, you get way, way better progress when everybody's on the same page. So that's pre-science. We talked a little bit about alchemy in the same way. Uh, so, uh, the shift from pre-science to what we might call normal science. So normal science is science that happens within a paradigm, within the shared set of assumptions and all that. Uh, it's not, I mean, you can think of what would attract everybody to join in the same paradigm, right? People getting really good results or able to powerfully explain a whole bunch of different things. So one of the, one of the things that attracts people to the paradigm of thinking about electricity and static and dynamic electricity is the same thing, is that you can explain these very different phenomena. Like you've got a, you've got a weird chemical battery and you've got some amber that you rubbed with wool. It's not obvious that those are the same thing. And you've got lightning. Like, like experientially, from the, from the first person perspective, radically different phenomena, but somebody comes along and says, look, I can show you how these are all really the same thing. And furthermore, uh, so you're able to sort of predict and explain more stuff. A really good paradigm produces a whole bunch of uh, interesting open questions. So another thing that attracts people to a paradigm is that it's productive of new and interesting hypotheses. So uh, Kuhn describes this activity of working within a paradigm as puzzle solving. And this is what he actually thinks is most characteristic of science. Uh, that is, when a, a group of people are all making the same assumptions and using the same methods and then using those assumptions and methods to try to solve, you know, rel like they're not trying to understand what is the nature of electricity, they're trying to work out the detailed facts about how, for example, copper and nickel or lithium or something like that in a chemical battery, like how much electricity does it produce and under what conditions. Uh, so the detailed working out of the paradigm is what they call puzzle solving. And that's the vast majority of science. Uh, so if he's, if he's, uh, Kuhn had to pick something to say what makes something science, it's really this activity of puzzle solving. Um, so here's, a, here's an example of what he thinks, what Kuhn thinks is going on within a paradigm. Uh, so classic, I mean the classic example of a paradigm is Newtonian's laws, Newton's uh, mechanics. Newton comes up with these three laws of motion, object at rest, remain at rest, for, forces mass times acceleration, every action there's an opposite and equal reaction. And it's maybe tempting to think, ah, well, Newton worked it all out and the science was kind of static for 150 years, 250 years, something like that. But as, if you look at what Newton actually used, what, what, how did he apply these laws in his actual lifetime? It's really just the motion of planets, some pendula, like how, do, how does a pendulum move? Uh, and like, Tides. So he had a pretty good explanation for how the tides work. It's the gravity of the moon. He could do. He could mathematically model a simple pendulum, and he could tell you how the planets move. And that's kind of it. Uh, today we use Newtonian mechanics for like a huge variety of things. So practically all engineering is done in terms of Newtonian mechanics, for example, right? Like there's an amazing variety of things that we can apply it to now. But Newton didn't know how to do that yet. So Newton sets up the basic parameters of the paradigm, but there's hundreds and hundreds of years of work learning to use these laws and apply them to different things. 
So, for example, uh, Newton had nothing to say about air resistance. How do you, I mean, in, in lots of cases, air resistance is negligible, but in lots of cases, it's not. What do you do about that? Newton had no answers about that, and it was a, the work of centuries to get more and more detailed answers to that question. Vibrating strings, a perfectly Newtonian system, but he had no equations for dealing with it. Uh, fluids, so fluid dynamics is essentially, you can essentially derive the basic laws of fluid dynamics from the Newton's laws of motion and some very plausible assumptions about the geometry of the system. So like you got a pipe that's this wide and then fluid goes into a pipe that's this wide. How fast will it go? What are the forces? What are the pressures? Uh, so in, in some very broad sense, all of fluid dynamics is contained within those three laws of motion. But we're still working on fluid dynamics. Like this, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing field of study of trying to understand how fluids move. And the assumptions are still basically Newtonian, but it's enormous amount of intellectual work to get, figure out how to apply the paradigm to specific cases. So this is kind of the activity of puzzle solving, right? You're not questioning, when you're doing fluid dynamics, you're not questioning the basic assumptions of Newtonian mechanics, you say, okay, force equals mass times acceleration, that's fine. Now, suppose that I've got a, you know, a waterfall pouring into a river, how does that work? And Newton's equations don't tell you how to build a model of that. You've got to build the model, and this is a kind of puzzle that you're solving. So you're not, you're not even considering, so against Popper's way of thinking about this stuff, you're not even considering the idea that your studies of fluid dynamics are going to falsify Newton. Today, we already know that Newton's not quite right. So the, the game is not falsification. The game is trying to use the paradigm and apply it to new and interesting cases, trying to expand the application of the paradigm rather than trying to figure out whether it's right or not. Yeah? And that's, according to Kuhn, and I think this is plausible, the vast majority of how science is actually done. Yeah? So. Uh, and again, comparing this with Popper, who's kind of indifferent, actually, you know, he's utterly indifferent to where the hypotheses come from. So how do you come up with good hypotheses to test? And Popper doesn't care. It's not really his job. He thinks, not my department, that's psychology. Um, but notice that a paradigm can profoundly guide the process of coming up with new hypotheses. So this is, I mean, if you, this is, this is one of the most spectacular examples from the history of science that, I, that I'm familiar with. So Newtonian, the Newtonian paradigm plus some observations of uh, how the planets move uh, generated this really interesting hypothesis, this really good guess. Uh, and it was this, this moment, so in the mid-1800s, two different mathematicians slash astronomers uh, independently noticed that the orbit of Uranus didn't match the predictions. So, oh, there's something funny in, so we compare the theory to observations. Oh, Uranus is acting weird. It's not moving the way that the theory says it should. So here's one possible explanation. There's a big planet nearby. And they actually predicted where the planet should be in order to create the odd observations that they were seeing. They said, hey, if you point a telescope right there in the sky, I bet you're gonna see a planet. And they did. They discovered Neptune. The discovery of Neptune was a hypothesis-driven observation. So it's not just that you're observing things at random. You observe things because you think you're gonna find something interesting. And what tells you you think you're gonna find something interesting is the paradigm plus some observations. So this is like the paradigm guiding which, like of all of the, there's a whole lot of places in the sky you could point a telescope and most of them you're not gonna find a planet, right? So like the, the guess and check method of just like, let's just point a telescope up in the sky and see what we find. That's very unlikely to produce interesting results. Um, but once you've got a paradigm and some observations to compare it to, you can generate much more 
likely to be fruitful hypotheses, right? Your hypotheses are going to be high quality and likely to produce really interesting results. So at their best, a paradigm guides hypothesis generation. It, it guides you to the fruitful and interesting places to look in nature. And like most of the observations you could make are super uninteresting, right? You don't want to just randomly guess. The paradigm is what tells you about that. So if we're thinking about how science works, like again, Popper doesn't care about where hypotheses come from. Kuhn thinks we should. Kuhn thinks that if you miss the ways in which paradigms guide hypothesis generation, you have no explanation for how we found Neptune. So a really spectacular example. Um, now, moving one step further in the Kuhn cycle, uh, so you got this paradigm at the beginning. It's very rough. You know, it's very it's very hard to apply it. So it's very hard to compare theory to nature to see whether the theory is making the right predictions or not. And normal science is a matter of filling out the paradigm, filling out the details of the paradigm such that you've got more and more cases where you can compare observation to theory. And often that works really, really well. So when the paradigm is sort of flourishing, you've got lots of new cases where you can compare theory to reality, uh, and it keeps the theory keeps nailing it. Um, but the more articulate your paradigm becomes, the more likely it is that you're going to turn up anomalies, things that don't fit within the paradigm, things that don't match the theory. So uh, one of these same guys, actually. So uh, Urbain uh, Leverrier, one of the same guys that uh, helped discover Neptune, notices the following. Uh, Mercury's orbit doesn't agree with the predictions of Newtonian mechanics. It's got the perihelion of Mercury is what it's called. So you see how the, you know, New Newtonian mechanics predicts roughly that it should just keep overlapping itself. But as a matter of fact, uh, Mercury at two degrees per century, the orbit's sort of drifting. So the ellipse of the orbit is drifting through space around the sun. Uh, so that's the perihelion of Mercury. Uh, Newtonian mechanics predicts some perihelion, but the observed perihelion, the, the precession of the perihelion doesn't match observations. So we've got what you might call an anomaly. Uh, so this is 1850s, right? And again, comparing this to Popper, like, ah, theory doesn't match observation. It's 1850, and we've got an observation that doesn't match Newtonian mechanics. So we throw out Newtonian mechanics? I'd say that would be a bad move at that point in history. Yeah? Um, because here's another example of the theory not matching the observations, and it we explained it. It's, it's, you don't need to throw out Newtonian mechanics to explain Uranus's orbit. This was like, oh, cool, we found something really interesting. When theory didn't match observation, we found something really cool and interesting and new. So theory doesn't agree with observation. Nobody knows what to do with this. For like 70 years, nobody knows what to do with this. Um, and anomalies can hang around for a really long time. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, the the actual reason is that uh, Newtonian mechanics is wrong. So when you model this in Einsteinian relativity, you get this. You get this as a prediction. So you don't get an explanation. So they observed this in the 1850s. You don't get an explanation for it until general relativity. Yeah. So like, you gotta throw. So. Unlike the first case where you're like, oh, we would have been super foolish to just throw out Newton because of this orbital anomaly. This one actually is part of the evidence that, so this and the, uh, the eclipse experiment that I talked about are kind of the deep parts of why we move from Newtonian mechanics to general relativity. Yeah. So you, can't, you cannot explain this in, as far as we know, you can't explain this in Newtonian mechanics. But the fact that you can't explain something doesn't really tell you much about what you should do about that, right? You got an anomaly. Maybe there's some other gravitational mass doing this that we can't see. Uh, maybe we're doing the calculations wrong. You always do approximations when you do calculations. Maybe that's part of the problem. Um, sometimes we come up with 
extra little hypotheses. So when you've got an anomaly, often they just kind of hang around with no explanation. Uh, sometimes they're addressed, you know, you come up with a hypothesis specifically to deal with the uh, anomaly. So come up with what you might call an ad hoc hypothesis. That is a, a hypothesis that you, you kind of add, you got, your, you got your beautiful theory, you compare it to observation, uh, the perihelion doesn't look right. What do we do? So you add in a little extra hypothesis specifically to deal with the anomaly. And this is a way of keeping existing theory from being falsified, but in some sense it, it's, not a, it's not a great move. You don't want to be leaning on this for every time you observe a, an anomaly, right? Um, so here's a, I mean, one of the most famous examples. Einstein comes up with his theory of general relativity, but his theory of general relativity is incompatible with a universe that's static, that's just sort of hanging around in space, that's neither expanding nor contracting. So, and the belief at the time was the universe is static. The universe is not expanding and it's not contracting. It's just hanging around. Uh, so Einstein adds in what he calls a cosmological constant, something that acts against the force. So if the universe is just hanging around, gravity should make it collapse. So Einstein adds into his theory, he just puts an extra term in the equations, cosmological constant. The, the, the only reason he adds this in is to make his theory work with what he thinks the universe is like. Um, so it's, an, it's, a, it's a hypothesis used to sort of patch up a hole in the theory. It's not generated kind of from within the theory, it's just sort of, he just plugs it in there. Um, and then a little bit afterwards, Edwin Hubble shows that the universe is actually expanding. So the universe is not static. As, as, as a matter of fact, it's, it's growing. Um, so Einstein called that his, quote, biggest blunder. It's like, man, I really shouldn't have added that cosmological constant. Because it turns out it was just sort of a, rather than a deeply theoretic, theoretically driven addition to his theory, he just kind of, he, he knows now, after, after Hubble no, uh, sort of shows that the universe is expanding, it's clear that this was just sort of a, it's like a patch that you add in to kind of paper over issues. Yeah. Okay, this, this might be a strange question, but like, okay. You asking us, that's weird. That's <laughs> no, very I never do that. It's very so, uncharacteristic. So, like, you have the entirety of the universe. Yeah. Theoretically, you could have like, let's say there's more universe like out there mm -hmm. and we've only been looking here. Like, like, how do we know that there isn't more stuff out there? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So sometimes <clears throat> you might want an ad hoc. So here's the here's the trick. Here's the here's the tricky bit about dealing with this. Um, the more ad hoc hypothesis you add to a theory, the kind of weaker its predictive power. So what you want is for your theory to kind of like generate a bunch of predictions without having to be modified. You don't want to have to keep fine tuning it to match the observations. And if you're willing, because if you're willing to do an unlimited amount of that, you can explain anything. Uh, the Wikipedia article on this has a big picture of a leprechaun on it. You look up ad hoc hypothesis. It's got a big picture of leprechaun. And say, I'm going to explain everything in the world in terms of leprechauns. And you say, well, nobody's ever seen one. It's like, ah, yes, because they're invisible. Okay, but they don't, they don't do typically leprechaun things. Ah, well, that's because they're uh, fey and sort of like unpredictable. Uh, you know, they just love the laws of physics, so they make everything go according to the laws of physics. And anything that you say, if you're willing to add in more and more and more little ad hoc hypotheses, you can wrap everything into your leprechaun's rule of the universe theory. Uh, what you want is, so, I mean, to give credit to Popper, you do want your theory to be at least somewhat vulnerable to evidence, right? You want it to be such that the evidence can push back. So, I don't want to say that you never want to add in an ad hoc hypothesis, because sometimes small adjustments to theory are good and helpful. But if you're willing to do this for anything that comes up, ah, well, maybe Mercury is just different. Why has it got a perihelion? I don't know. Mercury's special, you know? And then you make the anomaly go away without having to substantially adjust your theory. So 
Now, scientists don't, they almost never just give up on their theories because it doesn't match because of a few anomalies. Uh, sometimes they can be explained. Sometimes small adjustments to the theory can turn out to be right. Uh, and it's really unclear what you should do with any specific anomaly. There's, there's just not a clear, Kuhn's, Kuhn's claim is, pardon me, there's just not a clear rule that you can always follow. Say, if you have an anomaly with your theory, do this. Um, because what it depends on is how much of the theory needs to be revised, how deeply do you have to sort of uh, reconfigure your, your ways of thinking, um, you know, is it likely that there's going to be a future object? Like, is there a Neptune in this equation, right? Is there some unobserved thing that's affecting what you are observing, such that you don't have to adjust the theory, you just have to adjust your beliefs about the specific things in the world? Uh, and just having the anomaly doesn't tell you any of that. So, uh, there's a kind of, and we'll talk about this next time, in this phase of the, of the Kuhn cycle, where the model drift phase, you're starting to see some anomalies build up. Model crisis is when people start to go, oh geez, this, is, this isn't working anymore. Uh, there's too many anomalies and we, we need too many ad hoc hypotheses to solve this till eventually you get the paradigm shift revolution kind of thing. Kuhn's gonna make the case that there's just not a logically defensible rule that you can use to say when that should happen. And in some sense, it's a matter of community or sociology, right? Like it's a matter of how people act and behave. Um, so this is in some sense a kind of, he's accused of boiling science down to mob psychology. So at some point, the, the, the trend goes from, oh no, we can fix this thing, we can fix this thing, ah, it's broken. So that shift from we can fix it to it's broken, we need something new, he doesn't think that there's, in the way that Popper was hoping that there would be just clear rules for how scientists should behave, Kuhn doesn't think that there's a clear rule there. And this is where he starts getting accused of a kind of relativism. So he's relativizing science to how societies behave, how, how be, people behave socially. Okay. Uh, so next time we'll talk about paradigm shifts and when they happen and why. We'll also talk about how the essay should be structured. Okay, let's call it there. Thanks, everyone.